tonight, please. Acts chapter 5. If you're visiting with us tonight, we welcome you to Temple. You folks watching online, you're welcome to join in with us as we study the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. I'm a Bible believer. Amen. And sometimes I don't fit in the uh, designed fundamentalist camp. I believe the Bible. Amen. Amen. Uh, in the book of Acts chapter 5, verse 33, when they'd heard that, they were cut to the heart took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, and had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And here's what he says. Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. Then he takes them back in some recent history. Verses 36 and 37. Now look at verse 38. And now I say to you, refrain from these men and let them alone. Now watch the wisdom. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. Father, bless this book in your holy name. Amen. That's the one we need tonight is the one that Gamaliel made reference to. Yes, it is. He is a he is a teacher, a sage. Uh, they call him Rambams and so forth and so on. He is a, he is a um, learned man, no question about it. We come to the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, as I mentioned to you last Wednesday night, and we get into an issue of the early church, verse 1, a murmuring between the Grecians and the Hebrews. Greek culture, as it was found in the Decapolis, the ten cities in the north and Galilee in that area, was literally opposed to the culture of the Hebrew that would be found in the southern part of the country. There was an issue there, big issue. And uh, I don't know if you know this, the Olympic Games, uh, they say, they were performed in the nude. And so therefore we have a culture that is definitely opposed to the uh, uh, to that of the Pharisee and to the strict uh, uh, conservatism of that group. And so when they get saved, I'm sure some of that is brought over into the church. And I'm sure that uh, there might have been some uh, problem between the Grecians and the Hebrews that dated back to their culture. Truth of the matter is, though, the culture is left behind and all of that once you're born again. Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither red, black, yellow, white. None of that. In Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, but in him you become one in Christ. The scripture says to make of twain one new man. But the apostles, now these are apostles, and they are they're being bothered with an issue, and this issue arises because there is a discrepancy in the ministration of these, uh, of these gifts and uh, the ministry that needs to be fulfilled and taking care of the Grecians and the Hebrews. It's not that they were at each other's throats probably. It was simply a matter of uh, one felt like the other was being shortchanged or mistreated or whatever. But something had to happen to deal with them. And so this is the common text that most people go to to say that these were the first deacons that were chosen by the church. Stephen's one of them. The word deacon doesn't show up in the text. As a matter of fact, the word deacon doesn't show up in the book of Acts anywhere. But that's not to argue against the text because what's happening here is essentially what deacons do. So it's always good, though. I'm a firm believer in this, that uh, you need to know everything you can about a subject before you enter into a debate about it or before you make a decision about what you believe about it and so forth. I've been the pastor here for 47 years. I love this church. I've put my life into it. I've dedicated myself to the ministry of Christ until I draw my last breath. That's what I intend to do. There is nowhere in the future for this preacher to retire. I pray that God will give me the strength and the grace and what I need to minister until he calls me home from this world. I would like to see him come. I would like to see the rapture take place. That would be a good thing. No question about it. It's called a blessed hope. But I have definitely dedicated myself to this ministry. 
When I came to Temple Baptist Church in 1976, the church had been through a number of pastors over a few years, and they were at each other's throat. There was a dog fight raging in this church. I know, it's kind of hard to, hard to believe, but it was. No question about it. It was. One, one said, oh, we love each other, and the other one said, oh, who are you kidding? We don't love each other. Right? Publicly, openly. But it's always good to acknowledge issues as they, as they arise. But I'm simply telling you that to have you to understand that I'd only been saved three years when I came to Temple. I didn't know anything. I've always had a mind that want to learn. And uh, God, <laughs> God, God uh, put me forth learning, no question about that. But I had to learn some of these things experientially the hard way, and some of them I learned from books and so forth. But I poured my soul into it. I poured my life into this ministry. Temple Baptist Church, as it stands today, is a product of uh, God's blessing and God honoring his word. He has done that. I, will, I fully agree with Gamaliel. If God's in it, you're not going to stop it. Amen. Amen. If he's in it, you're not going to stop it. You would do well to rob a bank as to try to stop the church of God. Amen. I'm not telling you to rob a bank, but I'm telling you that uh, when it comes to his church, the structure of the church has been brought into question in the last few weeks, and we feel like it's necessary now to begin to transition into what, we, what needs to be done here at Temple. Uh, I won't always be here. And I won't, if God calls me home, I definitely want to leave the church stronger and better than, uh, than it, you know, than when I leave it. I don't want it, I don't want the church. Therefore, if I have my, if I put my hand to anything, I want it to be right because I love this church. I don't know how many of you are conscious of the fact that the last few years have gone without incident whatsoever. No issues have been raised. Not a word about money, not a word about organization, not a word about any of that. How many of you are aware of that? Good, I'm glad you are, because that's very important, very important. None of these issues came to the front, but here recently some issues have come to the front and it's caused some problems. I'm not mad at anybody, I pray for a lot of people, and I would pray that God may do in the future whatever he may choose to do, who knows what's liable to happen. Some of the folks who left may come back. I want them to know they're certainly welcome. I hold no hard feelings toward people. I don't hate anybody. And uh, sometimes when you learn the scripture, as I'm going to try to teach it tonight, it helps you make decisions that you need to make. And a decision that's made out of ignorance can be embarrassing. And, but your pride will keep you from doing something about it later on. And so that's what I want to deal with tonight. So I'm going to talk about the issue of deacons. The issue of deacons have been brought forth. A deacon, as we find it here in, in the book of Acts chapter number 6, these men, and we assume that they were deacons, were called out for specific purpose. They were to minister to certain needs in the church. And uh, it's important to understand that not just anyone was called because it said plainly, verse number three, choose you out honest men full of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, you had to have discernment yourself to be able to choose someone full of the Holy Ghost. But note carefully, it's not just someone who floats in and floats out. It's not someone who wants to be up in front of people. It's not someone who is a power hungry, but it's someone who's full of the Holy Spirit. How do you know someone's full of the Holy Spirit? Well, read the gifts of the Spirit. Read the fruit of the Spirit. Look at it. Pray over it. See what God's Word says about that. Observe the person and see if they meet that standard. So what you do is you set people aside in your mind and you begin to pray. The church prays. Temple Baptist Church can make a right decision and a wrong decision. It's very important that the decision you make. In 1 Timothy 3, in verse 8, it says, Deacons must be grave, not double-tongued, not given to wine, not given to filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. See this? Set aside men full of the Holy Ghost. Let them be proved. A good deacon will help develop a church in faith in the body of Christ. He will be a blessing to the church. A good deacon will. He'll help it. He'll help develop growth. Young people will watch the deacons and they'll watch how they do their work, how they minister to people. They'll watch the movement of the Spirit of God in their lives. That's a good thing. That's what young people need to see. They don't need to see dog fights in the church. They need to see, uh, they see mature men and women are able to work their problems out. They will help unite the people in Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship means that we have thing in common, which is the love of Christ and the exaltation of Christ and his word. A good deacon will help unite the people 
in Christian fellowship. They will serve to make a place for the Holy Spirit to move freely in their midst, conscious of the movement of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something, folks. I'm sure that other preachers who they may listen to this tonight, may listen to the future, whatever. But here's the fact. If a man gets up in this pulpit and he hasn't prayed and he hasn't, and he hasn't prepared himself spiritually to be in this pulpit, he's wasting his time. He's going to rant and he's going to rave and he's going to make a lot of racket, but he's not going to do anything under the power of God. You learn that through years and years and years because sometimes you don't have time to do what you need to do to prepare spiritually and you're loaded down and you have to jump up in the pulpit and you've got to preach and you've got to teach and so forth and so on and then you wonder why it's so dead. It's dead because the Spirit of God has not anointed it. You've got to prepare. It's so necessary. So it'll be a place for the Holy Spirit to move freely. The Holy Ghost can be grieved and quenched. So you've got to be careful with that. They'll learn how to work together for the cause of Christ, knowing one of Satan's greatest tactics is to cause division among the saints. Learn how to work together. That's not easy, but they have to learn how to do that. People will be ministered to and learn to minister. The whole congregation will witness the power of the Spirit of Christ as he blesses his church through anointing and the gifts of the Spirit. Now, these are my words. I wrote these down. I didn't copy this from anybody's book. These are the words that God gave me to give out to you tonight. The whole congregation will witness the power of the Spirit of Christ as he blesses his church through anointing and the gifts of the Spirit. And you need, the gifts of the, you need to see the gifts of the Spirit functioning, moving in your midst. You need to, you need to see people who naturally or normally would not, would not uh, manifest what you see from them, but you know that somebody a lot bigger than them has begun to move in their life and they're doing things that's not normal for them to do. That's the gifts of the Spirit, and this is where God's glorified. People will be ministered to and learn to minister. The whole congregation will witness the power of the Spirit of Christ as he blesses his church through anointing and the gifts of the Spirit. Remember now, this preacher's coming back to that. Fundamental Baptists don't like to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. I know that's why I say I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm a Bible believer. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. I believe the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as plain as it can be, if you do it through the arm of the flesh, it's dead works. If you do it through the power of the Holy Ghost, it's unction and anointing, and God will bless it. And that's what we need. We need the gifts of the Spirit of God and, uh, in, in operation. Souls will be saved. They will be saved. They will be saved. The church is not a me mechanism. It's not a mechanical thing. It's not a, it's not a business. It's not an industry. It's a living, breathing body. It's a body of believers. Amen. And being a body of believers, it should have one spirit, one feeling throughout the whole congregation. Out of fellowship, believers will return to walk in fellowship and love with the Father and the Son, once again resulting in renewed fellowship with believers in the congregation. Nothing, nothing, nothing brings more joy to me than to see someone who's been faltering, wandering around, out of, the, out of the will of God, and to see them come back to the Lord. I love to see that. I love that. That's a wonderful thing. And the scripture says, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. The spiritual Christian is not the one that screams to the top of his lungs and swings from the rafters. The spiritual Christian is the one who knows a Christian in need and comes to him and helps him, he or she and does what they can for the glory of God. Now, you may get carried away emotionally here and there, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, that's, but, but the point is a lot of people judge everything by the outward appearance, and that's not, uh, that's not, uh, that has nothing to do with spiritual growth. Uh, Christians will grow and mature in such an atmosphere. Have you grown any? So how do I know if, I'm, if I've grown, preacher? Well, when things that used to get you so upset, upset, moved you, caused you to want to quit, walk out the door, now you're not so quick to jump up and walk out the door. Now, now you take a little time and you, and you pray over things and try to find something in the Bible, uh, some word from God, something that's going to give you some instruction and help. Uh, that's what you do. Then you can, if, if that's beginning, to, if that's beginning to, to manifest in your life, you're starting to grow. You're starting to mature. You're starting to realize, you mean to tell me that these people that I come to church with aren't perfect? Amen, folks. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, people will be motivated by a sense of love for each other. That's a wonderful thing to see them love each other. And the gates of hell could not move such a church. You say all of that because of good deacons? You better believe it. Good deacons. Good deacons can be the greatest blessing 
that Temple Baptist Church could ever have. Think about that. It could be the greatest blessing that Temple Baptist Church could ever have. Bad deacons, on the other hand, can bring a curse to a congregation of believers. And some of you that have been in church for a long time, uh, I'm sure at one time or another you've had experiences with bad deacons. <laughs> Don't you to raise your hand, but we're getting, we're getting some hearty amens in here tonight. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, I have to confess, I'll make a confession since we're talking before God tonight. God had blessed this church. It was, everything was going so well. God was giving me messages. The Spirit of God was moving, people coming, and all of that. And I really didn't get all excited about uh, moving the church to pick deacons. We have had some deacons, but they, they've uh, pilgrims. They were pilgrims. And so, you know, pilgrims make pilgrimages, and they've moved on. And uh, it's important to understand something. If a church lays its hands on you and calls you and sets you aside and says we're going to put we're going to put confidence in you and we're going to put trust in you and we want you to we want you to be here for this church you ought to take that seriously. How many of you agree with that? You ought to take that seriously. You ought to take it very seriously. You ought to take it seriously. Bad deacons on the other hand can bring a curse to a congregation of believers. I remember the church won't name it, but uh, deacons, children, the deacons' children got into it with each other. So what did they do? Well, instead of going to each other and settling the issue about their children, they drug it right straight into the church. And they brought the whole congregation, the assembly, into that dog fight. What did that say? That said that either neither one of those deacons had any idea what maturity was about. And neither one of them had any idea the responsibility they had to set a good example before that congregation. And I was in there that night when they did that. And I had been there every time the doors were open since I got saved. I was there every time the doors were open. When I got saved, I came to that church. And then the night that the deacons went after each other, they had called in their support from either side. And people started showing up in that congregation that I had never seen before. They came out of the woodwork. Now, how many has ever experienced anything like that? Do you know why there's so many Baptist churches in, in this country? Here's First Baptist, Second Baptist, Third Baptist. On it goes. This one busts from that one, booze down the road, busts from that one, splits, goes down here, splits again, and then splits and splits and splits again. And the first thing you know, they're scattered all over the place. And then what are they saying? They're saying they can't get along together. That's one of the things. Some issues that separate us, yes, and I don't have time to get into all that tonight. When it gets into basic doctrinal things, yes, these things matter. But if it's just a matter of personality clashes and so forth, power struggles, we should be able to work that out, shouldn't we? They can focus, now listen carefully to this. A bad deacon can focus their attention on money since they must use it to satisfy the needs that arise in assembly it would be easy for them to become bankers instead of ministers, obsessed with money and the power of money. The Bible said in John 12, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. That must have been a scene. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Here's what he said. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear that which was put therein. You notice carefully, the only thing that got his attention was money. That's all Judas Iscariot thought about. What was his downfall? Money, 30 pieces of silver. More issues will arise over money than any other thing. Let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest as you can with me tonight. 
You know me. You've known me a long time. How much do you hear me preach about money? I hardly ever mention it. Hardly ever mention it. But there are people watching this thing right here that will send their money to this church. They will support this ministry. A couple came in here Sunday morning from Georgia, visited with this church, first time they'd ever been here. Sunday morning from Georgia. He put a check for $20,000 in the collection plate as it passed by. And I didn't say a word about money. Where'd that come from, preacher? It came from God, that's where it came from. And he used him to do it. I'm just trying to make a point tonight for you to understand. I've been around a while. I know how this works. And so they, uh, they become obsessed with money. More issues will arise over money than any other thing. Why do I mention this? Because deacons will be around money. They have to as they minister, as they buy things, as they give things, as they do things. They can become obsessed with power. Some are good men until they get a feeling of power. It brings something out of them that they did not know was there. One of the things that will be brought out of a person who is intoxicated with power, they become a, they become a despot. They become a, they become a, a, a you know, a, just a dictator, I guess you might say. They love power. They feed on it. I don't like that. I've never, ever got any satisfaction out of bossing people around. I don't like it. I don't like to do that. That goes against my nature entirely. But in any event, there are those who do. And let me say this. If made a deacon, not ready for it, it can destroy the man. A good man. A good man. He has no idea what lies within his soul. But when he is made a deacon and he begins to taste that power, then it starts moving and bringing something out of him he did not even know was in there, and the people watch him change. I mean, has ever witnessed that? Sure you have. Sure you have. That's not good because it's destroying him. So what do you do? You need to do some serious praying about it, about who, is, who becomes a deacon in this church. And not only that, but you need to do some serious praying about this, that once they become a deacon, they may be sweet, one of the, you know, wonderful person, but then after a while, you watch a change takes place. You watch a change take place. That's when the church should have enough of the grace of God about them to come to that person and deal with them and say, listen, we love you, we want to help you, but this is not for you. You can't handle this. Everybody can't handle power, and everybody can't handle money. They can't do it. They can't do it. They just simply cannot. So it can destroy the man, and not only part of that. Thus the need for men full of the Holy Ghost. 1 Timothy 3, let these also first be proved. The work of Christ can be very trying at times. It can be. You have to deal with people. When I was a professional mechanic, I'd jerk a motor out, jerk the heads off of it, grind the valves, put a new uh, crankshaft in it, and pistons and cylinders or whatever I wanted to do, rebuild that motor. It never said a word back to me. <laughs> Did exactly what I wanted it to do. And I put it right back in there, fired it up, and away it went. No problem. People are so... <laughs> Oh, boy, are we not in a different ballgame. So what do you do? You have to learn to work with people. That's what you do. This is one of the requirements of leadership. Everybody is not called to be a leader. Leadership's not easy. You've heard it said that leaders are made, not born. Well, that's half-truth. The ability of leadership can be born in the genes. It can be, it can be written in your DNA. But you also need the training. You need the experience. You need to be where you need to be. But leadership is not an easy thing because you are leading people, and you may be leading people that don't agree with everything you say. They don't agree with it. They don't have the same, they don't have the same perspective that you have. So what do you do? You get mad and puff up? No, you work with them. Because if you cannot work with them, you are no leader. You have no business 
trying to be up in front of people, leading them, if you cannot work with people. How many agree with that? Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen folks. Now, my drill instructor at boot camp, he thought he was a leader. <laughs> you do this or you get, <laughs> and I won't get into the detail, and that was kind of a different leadership, see. He didn't have to compromise. He didn't have to get my opinion on anything. He said, you jump, you jump. You march, you march. And along with a few words that he called me, and I didn't even know exist when I got to boot camp. When I heard, I, I was called stuff I didn't know even existed. <laughs> it can be very trying. They can turn each other against each other, taking shots at the other, warring over what needs to be done, and who does it? What's that? That's power struggles. This happens. They can turn on the pastor with a power struggle developing in the church. And this is what happens. Nothing will destroy a church quicker than different factions fighting for power. Folks, that's, it. that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Nothing will destroy a church quicker when you have opposing power. They refuse to accept the, the authority of the pastor. The Bible is very clear that the bishop or the elders rule over the people. And I have to confess tonight and repent because I should have taught this more in the past because it's obvious to me that a lot of people are totally ignorant of what the Bible says about issues like this. And I feel bad about it. They should have read it. But let me give it to you tonight, what the scripture says. In 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse 1, it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. Who is this? This is the apostle Peter. He's an elder. He's an apostle. I'm an elder, but I'm not an apostle. There's the big difference. An apostle is one who saw the resurrected Christ. An apostle is one who has authority to write scripture. There are people out there today who call themselves apostles. Say, what do you do with that preacher? Ho-hum, turn the channel. Nothing personal. I don't hate anybody. But I, don't, I won't waste five seconds of my time dealing with somebody who calls themselves an apostle. It's a waste of your time. The elders among you I exhort, who am also an elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, partaker of the glory should be revealed, to feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Now this is scripture. Somebody has to take that, don't they? Does not, is, 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 is uh, this, is, is there going to be somebody who has to take responsibility? How many of you believe that there's a person in the congregation who ultimately takes the responsibility for this church? Who is that? It's the pastor, folks. The elder, the bishop. He is responsible. To who? God. I'm responsible. Well, if I'm responsible and I'm accountable, then I should have an authority, right? Absolutely, folks. And it's not this, uh, it's, you know, it's not this, it's not this Diotrephes type authority who loved to have the preeminence, it says, of him. He prating about, the Bible says, speaking against the apostles. And this is what Diotrephes did. The scripture says, neither is being lords over God's heritage. The apostle Peter said, I don't want that. Don't you bossing people around. You lead them. You don't drive sheep, you lead them. 1 Timothy 5, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Nowhere in the Bible does the word rule associated with a deacon. There are, there are, there are church uh, structures set up to where it is specifically set up where the deacon board is set in opposition to the pastor. And the purpose of the deacon board is to watch out, is to watch the pastor <laughs> and to counter the authority of the pastor. And that's, that's sad, but that does happen. I mean, has ever seen that kind of a thing go on? Well, of course you have. I mean, you, know, you know you have. That's the kind of thing that does happen. It shouldn't, but it does. But it says in 1 Timothy 5, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Then in Hebrews 13, it says, obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And then Hebrews 13, 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints, and they of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen.
So having said that, I want to say this to you. I propose that Temple Baptist Church have a completely separate group that oversees the money in the church. In other words, the treasurer and those in the circle of the treasurer. We have a treasurer in this church. We voted one in just a few days ago. All right. And the people around that treasurer that are involved in the distribution, the, in, the, income, the coming into the money, the depositing of the handling of the money, and I'm only part of it, nothing to do with it. Well, I haven't had anything to do with it, but I don't want now anything to do with it. But here's the point. It doesn't need to be the deacon board that does that. Remember, remember, money can corrupt you. And it's also a tempting thing. So we need people, this church needs people who are trustworthy, that can handle the depositing, the oversight, the taking care of the money. The trust the ch and the church trusts them, trusts their integrity. The deacons would turn to these people for their needs. They would focus their attention on the ministry of the church with money being a part of the overall work. In other words, the deacon needs money. We need money to do this. We want to help these people and buy some food here, whatever. And the people who oversee the money, there it is. It's distributed. Now listen carefully to this. An absolute necessity is the ability to work together. That's not easy. People don't see things always the way I see them. We differ in our opinions. I'm always open to hear an opposing opinion. I love dialogue. I really do. I really do. Just like this mess that's going on right now when they kicked out the Speaker of the House and eight, uh, eight Republicans joined up with the Democrats to throw, uh, uh, what, McCarthy? To th he's, I think he's a representative from California. To throw him out. All right. Here's what should be done. They should call together the House. They should bring all of their issues to the front. They should bring it before the people and point by point let us know why you wanted this man thrown out. Yeah, yeah. Instead of a bunch of nitpicking junk, bring it out. And this is what the deacons should do. They have to be able to work together. They've got to be, if, uh, well, so-and-so needs money. They need help. You know, we, we want to help them. The other one says, well, how much help should we give them? Another one says, well, I don't know. I mean... How, what is it going to take? Well, I don't think we ought to, I mean, I, I'm just, I don't believe we ought to give so much money. Oh, okay. So we got a deacon in some churches who's against everything. Get rid of him. <laughs> Get rid of him. Find yourself a man who's willing to sit down with other men. And so let's pray about this. Let's come to a consensus on this. This person needs help, you know. Let's, let's, and my position always is to be more liberal when it comes to giving them the money, you know. I mean, this, this couple from Georgia put $20,000 in the plate this past Sunday. That'll buy a lot of groceries. That'll buy a lot of tracts. That'll buy Bibles. That'll send the word out, won't it? Yes, it will. They didn't give me that money. They gave that money to Temple Baptist Church. Right. God led them here to do that. A few weeks ago, hadn't been that long, maybe a couple of months ago, another person came to Temple Baptist Church, put a check, $10,000 into the offering plate. That's $30,000 that was given to this church. A lot of churches would never say what I'm saying tonight because they say, if I tell these people how much money was put in here, they won't put their money in. Yeah, you will. Because you know we're not about money you know this money is going to be used for the glory of God. It costs money to buy TV time. It costs money to do what we're doing here. And I want to do more. I want God to raise up people who care, who want to get into the ministry here at Temple Baptist Church, who want to help, who want to do something for the glory of God. We had three women who work with the church, work with the, work with the young people in the church and ministries of this church. I took them back here in this office a few months ago, and we sat down. Three women, we sat down. They are, they are women in positions of leadership and responsibility. I said to them, whatever you want to do to try to reach the people you're dealing with and ministering to, I'm 100% on your side, 
and you've got carte blanche. In plain of words, whatever you need to spend to get the job done, do it. Oh, I didn't believe in that. I believe we ought to be, we ought to be overseers of God's money. I mean, we need to tighten up, get rid of him. We gave, uh, the church gave out uh, $5,000. They gave out $10,000. They gave out 5000 Did you know that every dime this church has given out in the last two months has been brought right back in here? Every dime, every cent, every bit of it has been brought right back. Amen. A fellow over in North Carolina, hand, hearts to hands, we've given him thousands of dollars. I know it hadn't been brought before the church, I take responsibility tonight to say that we give that money. Uh, uh, Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, thousands of dollars to help them. Uh, missionaries on the field, thousands of dollars to help them. To help them, to get God, to get the money in their hands, okay? All right, now this, I've been doing this. And this, these are the kind of things that deacons could help do, see? And I confess to you tonight, I've been doing it, and I didn't take any of that $1,000 and put it in my bank account <laughs> in case you heard otherwise. That money was given to the ministry, every dime of it, and God's given it back. He's blessed it. Amen. And he's going to bless Temple Baptist Church. Yes, he is. He's going to bless this church. I want you to pray tonight and let God move in your heart and... Uh, like I told you know, I told you the other day about the man who started meeting his house with some, with some young people, and it started growing, and they knew he cared for them, he loved them. They had a fellowship there. Now, he wasn't meeting in that house to start his own church to try to tear down the church he was going to. That's another issue. Every once in a while, a preacher will come in here, and he wants to draw a bunch of the young preachers following him, and he wants to drag them off somewhere else and start his own ministry. How many of you think that's ethical? That's not ethical. No. Any ministry that arises in this church, any, any way that God opens the door for you to minister in that ministry, do it. But it's to build this assembly. You don't tear people down. You build up the assembly. And God blessed it. So it's absolute necessity to work together. And you have to learn to do that. And you have to ask God for wisdom to know how to do that. I will work with you. I will work with deacons. I will work with them. I may not agree with everything they do, every, every method that they choose, everything, so forth and so on, but that's not the issue. The greater issue is the good of Temple Baptist Church. Who knows? Shucks, it's possible. I might be wrong. <laughs> it's possible I'm liable to make a mistake. See what I mean? If you're so full of yourself... You're so full of yourself and so full of your pride, and you carry your feelings around on your shoulder. Don't think that you're a leader, and don't try to get up in front of people and lead them. You've got to be able to swallow your pride sometimes. <laughs> you, you've got to be able to work with people, and I'm going to by the grace of God. So let me say this to you before I close tonight. Enter into this with humility and reverence because we're talking about a major change at Temple Baptist Church, a major change. And I can see it as a blessing or I can see it as a curse. But I think that God's given us people of wisdom here that will know the right direction to go. And it'll be a blessing. Pray. You need to start praying now. You know, now. Start praying now about the... Uh, uh, God laid on the hearts of people. It would be wonderful if God laid on the heart of so-and-so over here, so-and-so over here, and somebody back over here, and somebody over here. And lo and behold, they're all in agreement, and they never talk to each other. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? They didn't even know what each other was thinking. Yet they're coming up with the same names. That tells me the Holy Ghost is at work. Pray, folks. And I'm praying. I'm praying. Satan has assaulted Temple Baptist Church. Satan did it. He uses people. He could use me. He could use you. Use anybody. And so uh, I'm no fool. I know that I could easily fall in the hands of the devil. I know that. And you go back and you check, and you go back and look into the into the into the uh, into the past of Temple Baptist. 
you'll see where my hand was directly involved in giving out thousands of dollars into the ministries out here, helping missionaries and, and helping with hurricanes come, tornadoes tear up homes, and helping people. You'll see where I did that. And I'm doing that because we're in, we're, we're in transition. We need somebody now to come along and, and start taking, taking that responsibility. So let's pray for that tonight. And we haven't lost anything, have we? God's replaced every dime of it. I would tell you how much money we're sitting on in the bank, but I don't think I'll do that because it's going out over the line over here. Whatever stitch that you see on this property, everything that you look at, everything that's parked here, everything that goes on is paid for. Amen. The only thing this church has to pay, they have to pay, K we get a letter from KUB every month. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we pay KUB, we pay AT&T, we, you know, all, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance fees, that's it. Apart from that, the church is poised. The church is at a point right now to where this church can step forward and we can do a lot. Believe me. And money will not hold us back. We can do it. God had a reason for keeping me here for 47 years and to open the doors to do that tonight. And I want to see him do it. Don't you? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you take what, I've used, take what I said tonight and use it. I hope I didn't come across wrong. I hope, that, I hope I didn't project the wrong spirit in this house tonight. Lord, have mercy. What am I without you? What can I accomplish without you, Lord? What can I do? What am I? What can I be without the blessed Holy Ghost? Nothing. And I know that. I've failed too many times in the past. I've learned my lesson many times, many times over. I know what it is. I know what it is. But I'm in agreement with Gamaliel. If it be of God, you're not going to stop it. And I believe you're at Temple. And I believe you've got a reason for us being here. And I believe you're going to use this church. And I believe you're going to help people. And I believe you're going to reach out to them. And, Father, I just want to be part of it. I want to be used, Lord, and, and for you to raise up people around people that we can work with and get and get the work done in Jesus name I pray amen thank you for listening thank you for listening